In the middle of the 19th century, a man called Louis Agassiz was looking at the geology in the Alps and concluding that the valleys that he'd been seen, he was seeing and looking at, and a lot of the landforms uh, that were around in the Alps were evidence of the whole valley being occupied by ice. The landscape was formed by the action of ice. Now at the time, that was quite a strange thing to say because people, the general idea was, was the landscape had been given to us by God. And so what he was saying was that that wasn't necessarily true and that physical processes were responsible for that action. And he toured around Europe telling people what he'd found, convincing them one by one. Even Charles Darwin um, was a con convert to his theory. He first thought that the landscape was indeed given to us by God, but he changed his mind after seeing the evidence. The evidence of former glaciers in, the no in Europe and in North America is, is evident for everybody to see. You don't need to go very far uh, to, to see uh, mounting valleys formed by the action of ice where there no longer is any ice. And glacial theory was established as an idea, the idea that the world once had a lot more ice in it, an ice age. Well, this idea by the end of the 19th century was pretty well accepted and that the Earth had experienced an ice age in the past. And what we wanted to understand was what caused the ice age. And so by the end of the 19th century, people were started to put some ideas together. And one person who put an idea together was James Kroll. And he was a self-taught mathematician, worked as a janitor in a museum in Glasgow in Scotland. And he came up with uh, an idea that he, uh, to do with the Earth's orbit around the sun. The Earth orbits around the sun, of course, but it doesn't do it in a circular orbit. It has an elliptical orbit, and that elliptical orbit changes through time. And uh, when we're closer to the sun, we get more sunshine and more sunlight and more heat. And when we're further away, we get less. And he worked out that uh, if we get less heat at certain times of, of, of that orbit, then it could be that the amount of solar radiation coming into the planet is so small that it can cause the, the ice masses to expand. That was his idea. Uh, and people thought that was a pretty good idea. But unfortunately, by the time he died, no one believed that idea at all. And so he died sort of unfulfilled and people not believing his big theory. A Serbian mathematician, Mulatan Milankovic, in the middle of the 20th century, picked up the idea and added some refinements to it. And again, everyone thought this is a pretty good idea and, and it explains glacial theory. Uh, and all to do with the way the Earth orbits around the sun, the amount of sunlight that we would get from the sun as a consequence of those orbits. Unfortunately, he died with no one believing his theory either. It took to the late 1960s and uh, the ice core at the Vostok station to uh, make both theories that have come previously um, accepted. And, and it's this, the ice in Antarctica is a time machine. It, snow falls on the surface of the Antarctic, that's all fine, and people understand that. And when you have a snowball, it's pretty light, it's got a lot of air in it. Now in the middle of Antarctica, the very middle, where Vostok Station is, there's no very little um, sideways flow of ice. Most of the flow is downwards due to the burial of snow by subsequent snowfall. And so as that snow gets buried deeper and deeper into the ice, at a certain stage, about 70 years after it was once deposited as snow, the, the air within the snow gets cut off from the atmosphere above. That snow turns into ice, but the air in it retains as bubbles within the ice, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. The ice in beneath Vostok Station is 3,700 meters thick, and the ice at the bottom of that was deposited 450,000 years ago. So if you have an ice core and you drill down all the way to the bottom of the ice in Vostok Station, you pull it back up and you sample the air within it, you're actually sam sampling the actual air that existed all that time ago and every year in between. We have a continuous direct measurement of the Earth's atmosphere and its constituents, the composition, for the last 450,000 years. It's a remarkable thing. And when you look at the, the way that the Earth's atmosphere changes, 
and there are various ways we can reconstruct temperature from that, you see the types of uh, change is exactly what James Kroll and Militan Milankovic have proposed. I mean, it's, it's too much to be a coincidence. So all of a sudden, the idea of orbital variations around the Earth causing ice ages was accepted again. But the reason that Milankovic and Kroll weren't believed is because the changes that they were proposing, the solar changes they were proposing, are very, very small, a few percent in, in, terms, in terms of heat coming in from the sun. And people were saying that can't possibly cause ice ages. And it's true, that's not enough to cause an ice age. But what they weren't appreciating, those early researchers, was that the Earth doesn't work as a series of, of feedback processes. And what the Vostok ice core demonstrated was that it was carbon dioxide was the big driver of the change. The carbon dioxide level recorded in the Vostok ice core goes from about 180 parts per mil during ice ages to 280 parts per mil. That's within ice ages. And 200 years ago, that's what the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was on Earth right, right now. And that's what it should be, 280. And so uh, carbon dioxide is a big driver. Where it's low, you have less greenhouse gas, colder temperatures, ice ages. And when it's high, 280, warmer temperatures, interglacial conditions. Ice ages are paced by the orbital variations around um, uh, the sun, but they're driven by the carbon dioxide content. And so that's what we've learned from the Vostok ice core, and that's what we've learned about um, uh, ice ages. Now, where are we now with carbon dioxide levels? Since 1850, we've been burning fossil fuels at an industrial rate to fuel industrialization and mechanical processes and the way that we uh, transport ourselves around, around the world. Carbon dioxide levels now stand at 403.5 parts per mil. That's over 100 more than they should be. The last time we had that level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, was in a period in time called the Pliocene, 3.5 million years ago. Sea levels were 20, 15 to 20 metres higher, and the global temperatures were 3 or 4 degrees higher than they are right now. This is why we have to worry about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global warming, because if we do nothing about it, that's where we're headed. We're headed to global temperatures 3 or 4 degrees higher than they are now, and sea levels over 10 metres higher than they are now. might take a while to get there, but that's the destination. So when you extract an ice core, it's like three kilometers long. You do it in bits, of course. And uh, those bits of ice core are taken into a laboratory and they are sliced into very thin layers. And those bits of ice are then looked at for their, their chemical composition. You know, what is in the ice? Apart from water, what else is in the ice? And there will be air bubbles within that ice and those air bubbles can be sampled and there'll be dust in the ice, and that dust can be measured. Everything can be measured. These are very valuable samples, and it costs a lot of money to get a, an ice core. And so we, we do a very thorough investigation on every single little bit of the ice that we extract. And what it tells us is uh, important information about the atmosphere and what it was during the time that that ice was once snow falling on the surface of the Antarctic ice sheet. It tells us about the dust that was in there. It tells us about methane that's in the atmosphere. It tells us about carbon dioxide. It tells us about the isotopes of oxygen. Everything that we would want to understand about how Earth's climate has changed in the past is encapsulated within a little bit of ice buried beneath the surface of Antarctica. So, I, so ice cores tell us about the, the long-term history of, of climate from ice ages to, to between ice ages, and that's really good. But they also tell us about more short-term variations as well. And in particular, the ice cores in Greenland. Green, Greenland is also a very big ice sheet, and it's three or four kilometers thick in places. Uh, what the Greenland ice cores tell us is that at some times, in the last 20 to 10,000 years ago, Earth's climate changed by plus or minus five degrees centigrade over a course of just a few decades. And the reason for that is because water coming off the melting ice sheets in North America during deglaciation was interrupting the uh, heat transfer in the North Atlantic, the thermohaline circulation. The, the, oil, the, world, the world's oceans flow 
in an interconnected way, driven by salinity, salt changes in the North Atlantic. And if you put fresh water into the North Atlantic, you stop that flow of heat. And if you stop the flow of heat, then Great Britain, other parts of Northwest Europe, suddenly become much, much colder. And so that's what the ice cores in Greenland have demonstrated. The Earth's temperature around uh, Northwest Europe uh, changed from plus or minus five degrees centigrade over just a few decades. It tells us that when you melt the ice, if that melt water goes into the North Atlantic, we can change the local climate significantly. So the big questions in uh, the study of ice and in glaciology is, is how the ice is going to change with, with climate change and what those interacting processes are going to be as well. I mean, it seems quite a straightforward question. You have a block of ice on land and the, and the Earth's surface warms, the air warms and the ice melts and it goes into the ocean and the sea level goes up. And it's pretty straightforward, right, if you think about it in those ways. But actually, what we have is an interconnected series of different processes which are, which are going on. Uh, we have, uh, for example, the oceans and the heat transferred around the oceans is, is remarkable. We get about a third of the heat that we get from the sun in the United Kingdom received from the ocean as well. The oceans are massive stores of heat on our planet. And if the oceans change, then the heat supply around um, the planet will change as well. And so this is something that, that is driving us. As glaciologists, we're not just interested in the ice, we're also interested in, in the oceans as well. And the ice-ocean interface is sometimes the most difficult bits of an ice sheet to get to. And that's where the interesting questions are right now. So it's, it's undeniable that glaciers are retreating. All the glaciers around the world are, are largely retreating. And it's undeniable that the ice in Antarctica and Greenland is experiencing some loss as well. And so sea level is, is going to go up. And uh, it's likely sea level will go up by half a metre in this century, irrespective of what we do. The challenge for society is to stop the level of sea level, sea rise, going up by more than that. And if we don't tackle climate change, if we don't stop greenhouse gas emissions, and the world's temperature warms by three or four degrees centigrade, then we won't just get a metre of sea level rise. We'll get much more than that. And it won't just be finishing this century. It will be going on for the next several centuries as well. So what we're looking at here, people around living on this planet right now, we have a, a big choice to make. We can do nothing. And then our future generations uh, will have to deal with the consequences of that in terms of a warmer world and one with sea level much higher. Or we can do something and we can change our ways. We can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we can stop the effects of climate change from being as severe as they might. Now, we can't change them all. It's already too late for some things. Sea level is going up half a metre by the end of the century is extremely likely. But we can stop it being worse than that. We're the first generation to know that climate change is happening that people are responsible for climate change and that we can do something about it. No other generation before us had that three bits of information. It's just us. If we don't do something about it in history, we won't look so good. This is our greatest challenge and we have all the skills available to do something about it. We've got all the predictions available to tell us why we need to do something about it, but it's up to us to do it.